Yesterday is a huge name in games, and he's joining us by Skype from Texas. So please be very nice to him. He's just he's just woken up, and it's very early. So to interview the wonderful Warren Spector, please welcome Guardian Games journalists Keith Stewart and Jordan Erica Weber. Hi everyone. Hi again, Warren. All right, we're going to dive straight in because we only have about 25 minutes, and I think Keith's going to ask you a couple of questions first, if that's okay. Sure. Hi, Warren. Great to see you. Um, so, yeah, I just want to get straight into it, really, and uh, talk about your earliest days in games. And you came to games quite, through quite an interesting route. You worked at Steve Jackson Games and worked on sort of tabletop role-playing, didn't you? And I'm just wondering how that's kind of informed your career as a video game designer, starting out with that background. That uh, tabletop start uh, has basically driven everything I've done since. Uh, I, I kind of think of it as pathetic, but uh, every game I've done, uh, every single one, has been about trying to recapture that feeling I had in, in 1978, the first time I played Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, it was a huge influence. Uh, on the other hand, um, when I got into digital games, uh, I came in with this attitude, and I really literally thought I'm going to show these these computer game guys what interactivity is all about. <laughs> and it took me about two weeks to realize I knew nothing. Uh, so I had I had a lot to unlearn too. Uh, but uh, yeah, absolutely, it was a huge influence on me. Because I, I guess one of the key things that you've always tried to do with your game, especially with uh, System Shock and and uh, Deus Ex, was this idea of maintaining immersion in the game and making sure the player always feels part of the world. And is that something that was very valuable to get the experience of tabletop gaming? Because that's also about imagination and immersion. Yeah, I mean, if immersion is, is kind of the thing we do that, that no other medium does, right? I mean, we can make you believe you're in some alternate world uh, in a way that uh, movies can't and books can't. Uh, we can literally put you in someone else's shoes. And so that that's a, a critical element. And, and even in tabletop role playing, it's just your imagination and the imagination of your friends sort of coming together to build a world. But we can actually create a world for you to inhabit uh, in ways that no other medium can. So as, as soon as I say the words, no other medium can, which I probably say too often, <laughs> uh, that, that kind of implies a moral obligation to, to do that thing. And so immersing you in the world and, and never breaking you out of it uh, is, is kind of important to me. It's one of the reasons why I, I like all game developers, I often resort to cutscenes to communicate story elements, but I hate it. If, if, I could, if I could just have one thing in the world, it would be uh, to, to do away with cutscenes and cinematic adventures and all that stuff. It's a yeah. um, in, in the 90s, obviously, you were at um, a company called uh, Looking Glass, um, which is kind of one of the most important video game developers, certainly in, a, in, in America and in, and in PC gaming. And it's spawned so many big, famous designers. Uh, what, what was it about Looking Glass that produced such amazing games and such amazing talent? What was, what was kind of in the water there? Well, yeah, remember back then. What, sorry, there's a little bit of an act. Uh, but back then, uh, even in the, uh, the early 90s, we were still just kind of making it up as we went along, right? I mean, there, were, there weren't inventions uh, there are today. There weren't established genres the way they are today. Uh, everybody was kind of making it up. I mean, ask, ask John Romero. I just saw him there. I mean, you know, uh, he'll tell you. Uh, there, it was a frontier, and we're all trying to tame it, and nobody knew what was right and what was wrong. And Looking Glass came along at, at just that moment where it was still possible to do something that no one in the world had ever done or seen before. Uh, so that was part of it. It was just the time was perfect for that sort of thing. And places like uh, like King Glass and, and uh, Origin were all about uh, figuring out what games could do for me. The, the other thing was uh, Looking Glass 
was founded by a guy named Paul Nurath, and I'm, I'm working with him again now, which is kind of amazing, you know, 20, how many years later. Um, but he was an experienced game developer at that point, but he was smart enough to hire a bunch of, you know, 20 year old MIT college dropouts who had no idea what was really possible and what wasn't. Uh, so they, they, they had this whole attitude of, you know, no one's going to tell us we can't do that. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, and, and so there was this feeling of, of you know, we can, we can not just change the world, we can create it. Uh, time, youth, foolishness, <laughs> you know, you, all together and, and you got looking glass. The winning formula. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, yeah. I wish I could really create it now. <laughs> um, like maybe, yeah. Do you think, what, do you think it's not possible anymore to create that kind of um, culture and combination? I think it's a lot harder now. The, 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 at least the mainstream of the game business has become so, um, what's the word, Strat not stratified, but it's, it's fossil. You know, I mean, creating a new genre is, is not easy, especially in the mainstream where they're giving you tens of millions of dollars or a hundred million dollars. Uh, thank God there are Indian developers out there who don't have the same kind of financial constraints mm. because they're still, I mean, anybody who thinks games are a solved problem just isn't paying attention. There's still plenty of new stuff to do, um, but it's all happening uh, at the, uh, the kind of indie level, at the mainstream level. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm encouraged to that the DPs are doing that sort of thing, doing kinds of games. But um, I wish I saw more uh, of the mainstream picking up the ideas. I mean, you know, I haven't seen that yet. I find, uh, I find it very frustrating. Okay, we'll, we'll go back to talk about that in a sec. But first of all, I just want to mention for the benefit of everyone here, you're now working with Other Side Entertainment, right? And you're bringing back System Shock with System Shock 3. Is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, Paul Nura, who found Other Side, got the rights to... Uh, Underworld and System Shock back somehow. I mean, <laughs> Electronic Arts doesn't give up its IP lightly, but anyway, he got he got the rights back, and so we're uh, we're trying to bring back both Underworld and System Shock. Now. And you're working on that with another with a few other people from Looking Glass, is that right? Um, well, there are, there are some people consulting from Looking Glass. I mean, I talked to Doug Church, who was uh, obviously the secret master of gaming, uh, <laughs> without whom none of us would be here. Um, you know, he's he's been consulting, and Tim Stelmach is. Uh, who is uh, a lead designer at Looking Glass has been working with me and, and with uh, Paul on, on those projects. There, there are a few other folks. Uh, I mean, Terry Brosius is, is back uh, going to do some voice work for us. And so there are some folks who are coming along uh, from, from the Looking Glass days. But my team here in Austin, I'm, I'm in Austin, Texas, and Paul's working in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my team, I've, I've pulled people from uh, Ion Storm and Junction Point uh, to work with me. So uh, there's there's a lot of experience at others. Oh, cool. Okay, so why did you decide to bring back System Shock then? Why is now the right time to bring it back? Well, uh, the right time is easy because Paul got the rights back. And, uh, <laughs> uh, he, he's been trying for years, and uh, finally, I guess, I guess his persistence wore the powers that be down. So uh, that's that's part of it. Um, I got involved because uh, last December. Uh, I've, I've been a consultant uh, and an advisor to other side since it was formed, and so I went out on fundraising trips with him, with Paul, and we were out on one trip, and he sort of casually turned to me and said, hey, I got the rights to System Shock back. And at the time, I was still teaching, so I had a full-time gig, you know, and I, and I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking clearly at that moment. And so I just turned and I said, joking, you know, I should do that for you. And like two weeks later, he called me back and said, you should do that for me. And, and so I ended up, you know, I couldn't say no. Um, the, the real thing, though, is, well, there, there are two things. One is, how often do you get the opportunity to come back to something that you helped create 20, 22 years earlier uh, and bring it up to date and, and, you know, give it to a new audience? That's, that's pretty exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And here's... Again, pathetic is the word of the day. I haven't had enough coffee yet. <laughs> the pathetic thing is, um, I've, I've said for years, if you just upgraded the graphics and the sound and the user interface on System Shock, you would have a state-of-the-art 21st century game. And I, I actually sadly believe that. So if we do that, and then we take advantage of everything we've learned over the last 20-plus years, 
I, I think there's the opportunity to do something really special. Uh, and then there's Shodan, man. I mean, the world needs more Shodan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> yeah, I was going to obviously and say... we got more Shodan, whether we wanted it or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, obviously, since um, with System Shock and with uh, Deus Ex that came later, they're both games that explore the idea of, like, cy- the cyberpunk idea of rogue AIs and hackers and global pandemics and biologically engineered, uh, like augmentation. These were all things that were science fiction then, but now they're kind of fact. So um, has it been weird to see that happening? And how are you going to revisit those themes or update those themes for the, for the 21st century? Uh, I don't think it's weird. I think it's exciting and cool. You know, I want, I, I'm not a huge fan of motivational posters, but I actually do make up these posters that I put all around the office that, that you know, I've done this for years. They say things like play style matters and, you know, get get yourself off the stage and let the player on it and all these little sayings that I've got. And one of them is let reality be your God. Um, everything in Deus Ex, for example, was based on something that someone somewhere believes. You know, I, I, and even on Epic Mickey, I said, you've got to show me the reference material before anything goes in the game. And so uh, on, on Deus Ex and, and System Shock, we were just, you know, ideas don't come out of, out of the ether. Well, they do. They literally come out of the ether, uh, out of everything that's going on around you. You know, they don't come from nowhere. And so you try and pull from things that people actually care about. Um, it's, it's foolish to, to try to make a game and convince people to be interested in something. It makes more sense to me to find things that people are already interested in and that I'm interested in and then make games about that. And so, uh, you know, the idea of, I mean, look, Bruce Sterling, the, one of the fathers of cyberpunk fiction was my first dungeon master, you know, when I played d d So it's, it's probably no surprise that the cyberpunk you know, ethos has kind of pervaded the, the work I've done, right? Um, so uh, hacking and uh, cyboxu, you know, the rise of, of of uh, you know enormous corporations that replace nations, all that stuff is stuff that I've been interested in for years. And the, the System Shock team, everybody on that team was was really into that stuff. Uh, and on Deus Ex again, the team was into that stuff. So it's no surprise that it, it showed up there. Um, and it's no surprise that we kind of predicted stuff too. Um, if you're if you're basing things on um, you know, sort of reality-based science fiction, or better, pulling things from the headlines uh, and from the conspiracy websites. Uh, you're you're going to get some stuff right, uh, and we did. So I'm not, I don't think it's weird, and I'm not really surprised. I'm very pleased about the fact that we're now seeing all that stuff. Uh, what we're going to do now uh, in System Shock, it, it will come as no surprise that we're going to be exploring those same themes, uh, plus a couple more. Uh, and it's just a question of uh, reflecting how far we've come. I mean, the way we presented hacking in System Shock 1, you know, not not too much the way we're hacking is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, hacking is not a flight simulator. Um, so we're going to try to give you the feeling that you're hacking uh, in a much more uh, believable way. Uh, we know a lot more about, uh, about the way the mind works and about neural implantations and and the singularity, where, you know, AI outstrips human intelligence. We know a lot more about that now. And so we're just going to take all that stuff we know now that we didn't know then and incorporate it into the overarching fiction of the game. I'm interested in this idea of making hacking more realistic in your game, because a lot of video games recently have tried to kind of gamify hacking and make you feel like a hacker without actually teaching you how to code. How are you going to go about that? Uh, if I told you that, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I'm sorry. It, 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 we're we're midway through the concept phase on System Shock Three, so okay. anything I said now would a get me in trouble and b probably be a law. So <laughs> we have aspirations, we have ideas, we're working on prototypes. Uh, we're not going to teach you how to write code, <laughs> but but we are going to introduce you to uh, the the tools of hacking and the methods of hacking, and then turn it into a, what I, I uh, anticipate will be a deeper game than, uh, I, I tend to hyperbole, but you know, like we're gonna try to do a, a deeper dive into, into hacking and make it a more important part of the game than any other game has that isn't like dedicated to hacking. Okay, 
So you said earlier that you think that uh, you, you said you've always said that if you just made System Shock, you know, have better graphics and better audio and stuff, that it would be a very modern game. What is it about the System Shock series that you think makes it? I mean, because you've talked about um, how you don't think there have been many advances in mainstream game design, um, but it seems like you think System Shock is going to fill that need. What is it about System Shock that makes it able to do that? Well, I think uh, System Shock was in its day. Well, let me back up one step. Um, you should put John on screen, John Romero on screen for what I'm about to say. It's important <laughs> to remember that uh, Ultima Underworld shipped two weeks before Castle Wolfenstein, so there. <laughs> and, he's, ju uh, he's just stormed you know, out. <laughs> my work here is... Uh, uh, no, you know, uh, Origin and, and at the time Blue Sky and later Looking Glass, uh, we were all about... Uh, immersing players in the world, I mean, making you believe you were really there. And uh, in its in its day, System Shock did that, you know, if, if I can if I can brag on the team's behalf, you know, it, it did that better than any other game. It was it was uh, built on a on a, a as much of a world simulation as we could create back then. It never broke you out of the fiction of being in this world. You know, there were there were no cutscenes, right? I mean it was it was you alone in the world, and it, we didn't even give you an avatar. It was just, you know, the first-person perspective, you're the hacker in this world alone and afraid and, um, you know, unprepared to deal with the, the threat of Shodan. Um, that level of immersion hasn't been matched many times since. Uh, and I'd also say that it's um, its approach to role playing. It, it, it was it was at its heart. I mean, System Shock is a first person shooter, right? I mean, it, it just is. You have to admit that. But it also inc incorporated elements of survival horror and and role playing. You know, most people think of role playing as you know character classes and stats and secret diagonals. That's that's bullshit. <laughs> that has nothing to do with. That has everything to do with R O L L playing, but not R O L E playing. And System Shock was an R O L E game. It was, you know, how do you interact with the world? What sort of player are you? It was the first game that really expressed that mm. uh, in, in the in a way that sort of pointed you in a new direction. And and sadly, I don't think enough developers have followed in the footsteps of System Shock. Uh, there are certainly games now, I mean, like, you know, Bioshock is, is sort of a kissing cousin. Uh, <laughs> the Dishonored games, you know, with uh, half of my old Deus Ex team is making Dishonored now. I, I couldn't be prouder of those guys. I mean, there are games that have come along that are kind of following in the footsteps of System Shock, but um, the purity of that experience of being immersed in that world and not having to deal with the absolutely horrific conversation systems we put in games. Uh, I think, you know, to this day, makes System Shock really special. Okay, so I think Keith has a question about that, but just quickly I wanted to ask, does that mean then that System Shock 3 won't have cutscenes either? If there are cutscenes in this game, I invite everybody in your audience to come kick me really hard in the ass. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good to know. Which is not, again, we're, we're midway through the concept phase, and there are people on the team who want to have cutscenes, and you know, in, in Epic Mickey, which, by the way, expressed exactly the same gameplay philosophy as every other game I've done, even though the poor gamers didn't give me credit for that. Anyway, <laughs> nothing. Uh, I liked it. Well, uh, you know, there were cutscenes in, in Epic Mickey for a variety of reasons. Uh, my hope is there will be no cutscenes in System Shock 3. Okay. Um, one thing, it, you, talking about immersion again, one of the things that um, System Shock helped to bring about was the idea of environmental storytelling. So um, you found out about the world through reading emails and reading reports and things like that. And it was revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> it was revolutionary at the time. But now, of course, it's become a very, very used form of handing out narratives. So are you going to be kind of rethinking the idea of environmental storytelling in, in System Shock 3? And, and if so, how are you going to do that? Uh, I wouldn't say rethinking. We'll certainly be um, taking advantage of, of everything that we've learned about environmental storytelling in the last 20 plus years. Uh, it, it will, it, it's such a critical part of the system shock experience. You're right. You know, uh, and we are. Uh, 
I think it's probably safe to say that everybody in, in the game except for the player will be dead, uh, <laughs> which certainly puts uh, a, a great deal of emphasis on the environment. Uh, the, the big thing that, that we're going to try to do, again, bearing in mind where we are in development, so nobody can hold me to this. Everything <laughs> could change this afternoon. Um, but we're looking at creating uh, a much deeper simulation and a much a much deeper environment, a much more, you know, that you can explore more deeply and interact with more deeply. And so I think if you if you combine uh, the elements of environmental play and environmental storytelling that that were pioneered back in the 90s and are now pretty commonplace and uh, enhance that with the the most interactive world that I've ever tried to create, uh, I think I think that'll add up to something pretty new and exciting for players. Uh, not just from an Arab standpoint, from a gameplay standpoint. Okay, so just to wrap up then, because I think we're nearly done for time. Um, oh, looking. Brian, uh, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> I mean, you'll have to cut into Brenda's time, and I don't think anyone here is going to be happy about that. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, who dared that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask about looking outside of your own games, what kind of things you are interested in that other people are doing, apart from the people who you, you used to work with personally, maybe. What kind of things in modern game development are exciting to you? Um, what kind of themes have you seen um, in modern game development that you're interested in? Well, you know, when you look at uh, at some of the uh, indie games out there, people are starting to explore real world things. You know, I mean, games like Papers Please and, and, and a variety of others. Um, you know, are they're dealing with uh, politics? There are games now that are dealing with health issues. I mean, and not just not serious games. I mean, I'm not talking about serious with a capital S games, but serious with a lowercase s. You know. I find that really exciting. Uh, there, are, there are games that are exploring new ways of, of uh, telling stories. Um, I, I kind of this, this is the kind of question I hate because I hate giving I hate naming names because I don't I don't I want to keep my friends not just games that I don't like, and I, I don't want to endorse you know a game or two here and there, but uh, I I think there are people especially on the indie side. Finding really interesting ways to tell stories uh, that uh, I never thought of, uh, for sure. Okay, so being less specific, then, what kind of general things do you just want to see more from from other game developers? Oh, that, that's easy. Um, uh, the the one thing, okay, if I could have, there are two things in there. Um, I want to see people pay as much attention to non-combat AI as they do to combat AI. Uh, we put so much effort, on the mainstream side at least, into, into fighting uh, and fighting. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it would be nice if I could interact with a, with a character in a game, in a single player story game, in a way that felt like what we're doing right now. I mean, this is not direct face to face, I can shake your hand interaction. But I, I know that, at least I think you're real humans. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're behaving like real humans. And I don't get that experience in games. And related to that, someone, somewhere, I mean, like if you turn the camera around to face the audience right now, I would beg everybody in the audience, someone come up with a conversation system that, that is more sophisticated and more believable than we were doing in 1989. Because other than a couple of people have added a timer to, to you know choosing options on a branching tree, there has been zero, <laughs> zero progress in conversation systems in video games. I mean, how, how can we how can we look ourselves in the face in the mirror anymore? You know, so you put those two together, more believable human behavior in a non-combat situation, and believable conversations. And I would be incredibly happy. And if I knew how to do it, I'd do it. You know? <laughs> um, but someone out there way smarter than me uh, should be working on that every single day until they, they solve the problem. So someone form a team of foolish 20-year-olds who can figure <laughs> that one out. Exactly. Man, that would be awesome. <laughs> cool. A good call to action, I think, to end on. Um, if everyone in the audience wanted to stay still, we're going to switch over to Brenda now. But thank you, Warren, for speaking to us. Can we get a round of applause? Can you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Warren. Thank you very much, Warren. Goodbye.